2020, but it hasn't been a very good year, has it? It's been a horrible year, in fact. A very difficult year for all of us. And uh, thankfully, uh, uh, there's something more positive on, for us on the horizon in, in 2021. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to present uh, some positive stuff here today uh, on Jazz Video Guy Live. Uh, my guest today is Joel Fram, uh, a really, really excellent uh, saxophonist. Uh, we're going to look at some of his music in a second and talk to him at length about his life in jazz and uh, what it's like living in Brooklyn today and surviving in these crazy times. Uh, next week, uh, Joe Farnsworth is my guest. Wow. Joe's a fantastic drummer. I sometimes use superlatives, but it's only because I feel it. I mean, Joe is really a superb drummer uh, with a real sense of uh, history for this music. And uh, we will uh, have Joe joining us next Friday. But before we get started, let's look a little bit Let's look and listen to the music of Joel. Thank you. 
What's up, Brett? Where was that? What did you play and who were you playing with? That was in uh, Helsinki, I believe. And uh, it was, um, of course, you're going to put me on the spot with my brain is not going to work, but it was Ari Honig on drums. Uh, it was um, uh, uh, Johannes Weidenmuller on bass. And of course, I'm going to space on the piano player's name, which is terrible. Um, it was quite a while ago. I, I, maybe, maybe I can kind of research that a little bit. I, I, for some reason I can't, I can't come up with the piano. It's okay. Thing, it's okay. We'll drop it into the, uh, the description. If it, you'll probably think of it in 15 minutes, that's the way these yeah. things usually are. Sadly, <laughs> one of the aging, uh, things that happens is you, you, it's like the file is there, but you just can't open it. Yeah, and I know. You're it's walking true. down the street 10 minutes later. There it is. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Finland, Helsinki, was that a jazz festival or a club? Or it was. It was a jazz festival. It was one of their one of their stages there. I, I played that festival a couple times. Um, really, actually, really nice place to play. Um, and uh, so I think that's maybe I don't know three or four years ago, maybe something like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of the international nature of this music, I just wanted to welcome some of our viewers today. Uh, Michael from West Hartford is here. Uh, we've got G. Mazel from Nova Scotia oh, wow. over in the eastern provinces, uh, Scott from California, Carl from uh, Belgium is here, Bar, I think I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, is from Russia, uh, our friend Charles from Glasgow, and wow. uh, Jonas, talk about my, the hipness of my viewers, Jonas Kohlhammer tells us that Eric Niceberg yes. was on piano. Oh. I'm you sorry, know? Eric. I know I know you and I remember you, but I just it c couldn't come to mind. Oh. No problem. And uh, hello, Dawson from Washington State. If you're just joining us, let us know uh, where you're from. <coughs> Pardon me. Chimazo tells us he is a former student of Jackie Mack and Jackie Byard. Wow. Oh, wow. A couple of masters to study with. So, Joel, you're originally from Wisconsin. You moved to West Hartford when you, were, when you were a teenager. How did you get into jazz? How did you get into playing the tenor saxophone? Well, I started playing the tenor saxophone in Wisconsin because uh, my best friend, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, uh, is and remains a saxophonist actually now. His name is Giovanni Washington Wright. And um, he lives in Texas now, but he w lived a couple blocks away from me in Racine, Wisconsin. And um, he was a really, really fine uh, young saxophone player, and we were really good friends. Uh, and I had been playing in the school jazz band, and I had also been taking piano lessons from when I was a little kid. So I had some talent, 
Um, but I never really liked any of the instruments that I was playing in the, the school band. I played flute for a little while and French horn for a little while and bassoon for a little while. And then um, he said, man, why don't, you, uh, why don't you ask the band director if you can play in the eighth grade jazz band with us and, and, and uh, see if he needs a saxophone player. You could play saxophone. So I, I asked the band director uh, if I could do that, and he, uh, he, you know, he gave me this student tenor and told me. I remember the day he said, "Go in that closet and figure it out." <laughs> and so I, I went in the closet and put my fingers down on the horn and tried to figure out where they go, and and uh, that was the first day. So um, then the big thing that happened, obviously, was was I, I uh, in 1985, the next year, in the middle of my freshman year of high school, my father got this job. Uh, at the uh, Hartford Current. Uh, he's an education journalist for the Hartford Current for many years. And uh, the whole family moved east to West Hartford. And um, I ended up in uh, the uh, Hall High School jazz program headed up by Bill Stanley, late, the late great Bill Stanley, and um, met Brad Meldow at the time and also met uh, an incredible uh, uh, saxophonist named Pat Zimmerly, who was a couple years old, older than me and really became my mentor. Um, and uh, the, the night, actually, I can kind of trace it to one day. On my 16th birthday, we had a nighttime rehearsal with the, with the uh, uh, high school big band. And at the end of the rehearsal, um, they counted off a, a chart on Cherokee or something, something really fast. And, and they counted it off. Instead of playing Cherokee, they all played, the whole band played Happy Birthday. And they had bought me um, six jazz records, uh, which were really, really hip for considering they're coming from a teenage band. The, uh, they bought me uh, Freddie Hubbard, Ready for Freddie, um, Phil Woods, Rights of Swing, uh, the new Miles Davis Quintet, uh, Cedar Walton, Eastern Rebellion II, um, uh, Horace Silver, Sterling Silver, and I think there was one more that I'm not going to come up with. Oh, and Art Blakey, uh, Ugetsu, uh, which is like, I mean, just an incredibly hip gift. Uh, and that, that just really changed the direction of my life in a way because I became very, very uh, obsessed uh, with uh, learning about that music. Um, and so that's that's what really set me on this trajectory. Yeah. Now, when we hear you play, I mean, for me, the first thing that jumps out is your sound. And one of our viewers, Mike from the UK, commented, his sound is amazing. So for those young tenor players out there, for musicians in general, who are trying to find their own voice, develop their old own sound, how did you do it and with the wisdom you've acquired in the years, what do you recommend? Um, well, there, there were a couple things that happened. Uh, when, I, uh, when I went to college, um, I studied with John Purcell, um, and uh, he really had a lot of amazing things to say about um, the physics of the saxophone and, and also just... Um, uh, the physical aspect of, of how, how about embouchure and breathing. And he taught me a lot about that stuff. Um, um, I got, in a way, it was interesting because I, I, it's, it's a little bit of a yin and yang story. I, I, uh, I really got into his concept for a long time, almost to the point where um, I became so obsessed with it that uh, it became a little paralyzing <laughs> for me because I was so obsessed with my sound. It was hard for me, hard for me to accept anything less than some optimum unrealistic ideal of what sound could be. But so the, the second half of that was after I got out of school, um, I ended up uh, taking a couple lessons with Dick Oates, who kind of um, actually allowed me to relax again. Uh, and after I'd done all of this really, really intense exercise and study on sound, he said, man, you know, that's great. But, but in order for you to have fun and, and relax, you, got, you have to be a little bit loose. You have to be a little bit more accepting of what's coming out of the bell. Um, and so I would say the combination of those two factors, in addition to um, the, I, maybe the bit and maybe the biggest thing that that happens is that for me, I transcribed a lot of solos um, and and I didn't stop at just transcription, but I really uh, digested those solos in a deep way. I mean, I, I remember one summer writing down this uh, entire Johnny Griffin solo on rhythming from Thelonious in Action at the five spot. And um, and I basically lived inside that solo for about a year um, and just practiced it almost to the exclusion of everything else just because I was so enamored of Johnny Griffin and I want I really wanted to uh, be get deep inside what he was doing. So that kind of um, sort of in absentia uh, mentorship or, 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 or you know, uh, 
being a being a um, a follower like that or a student of the music, uh, even though I didn't uh, really get to study with him in person, um, that was a that was a big deal for me. I'm going through those periods of time of intense imitation of you know Griffin Getz, uh, Sonny Rollins, those kind of people. So that that was that that's a big in in a way a very very big part of how my sound developed. Yeah, well, there's something very special about the tenor saxophone. Every instrument is special, but there's something about the tenor, the voice of the tenor. Some say it's closest to the human voice. I mean, obviously, it's, it's something quite different. But all great jazz musicians, uh, you can usually tell who it is by two or three notes, just by that sound. That's how powerful uh, that is. I mean... Uh, when I hear like Ben Webster, you know, one or two notes, boom, or Coltrane or, or Prez. I mean, it's just it's that's one of the things that make this makes this such a unique art form because uh, each uh, person approaches it uh, from their own perspective. And, you know, it's like Picasso said, uh, I only copy for I forget the exact quote, but something along, along, along the lines of. I only copy from the masters, you know, and I think when we start out, we copy from the masters and then we develop our own thing, which you, you definitely has done. I wanted to go back for a second because we both share those roots in West Hartford, Connecticut. You grew up in Racine. By the way, did you know Ben Sidron in Racine? Well, I, I met him after the fact, and I know his son, Leo, too. And, yeah. and uh, so I, I know them uh, not really well, but I do know Ben and Leo. And, and, uh, but that was kind of after we had left. I, I was really pretty unaware. I was only 15 when we left her scene, so I didn't know him back then. Yeah. Uh, but we kind of filled in the blanks after, afterwards. Yeah, Ben's but ben, a, is, ben is fantastic. Ben was on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's a wonderful fellow. Done some great work over the years and a talented son in Leo. But... Uh, I grew up in West Hartford. You moved there when we were 15. We're 20 years apart. But I think one thing that was similar is that West Hartford always had a very good music program in, in the schools. I started playing the trumpet when I was in fourth grade. Uh, you were already there. But even when I was there, at I went to a different high school than Joel. I went to Conard. He went to Hall. There was a fantastic uh, jazz program in Hall High, headed up by a guy named Bill Stanley. And that was really, in a way, predated the whole jazz education thing. Because while well, I graduated in 67, at that time, there were very few jazz education programs uh, in colleges or high schools. And that changed dramatically. And then sadly, in the 80s, when the Reagan administration cut arts funding, especially for education, we lost a lot of music education program in schools. But some have remained, and jazz education is an international movement. I mean, it, it's had a fantastic effect on the music. So could you say a few words about what it was like being in a jazz education program, such a professionally oriented band in high school, and how that impacted your life and your music? Yeah, well, it was it was huge for me because in, in two ways. Uh, it was a little bit of a dichotomy because I was getting sort of the discipline slash, you know, uh, practice and or or the uh, the tools uh, with which uh, to uh, subsume this material from Bill Stanley, uh, because he had such an incredibly regimented way of working, um, uh, sometimes a little scary. Uh, but but I but he the, the big thing that Bill t taught me that Mr. Stanley taught me was that um, he taught me how to break problems down into digestible pieces. So um, whenever, you know, he would talk about learning a piece of big band music and he would say, okay, you're not going to learn the whole thing all at once. Take it bar by bar, take it phrase by phrase and work on a phrase. He said, work on it so much that it sounds unworked on. He would say, you know, work on it until it has the ease of water off a duck's back. He had all these little, these little uh, uh, adages that he would, that he would put out there. And that really stuck with me. So that was number one. And in addition, I had these students around me, including Brad Meldow, including Pat Zimmerly, and not just them, but many others, who were really, truly uh, loving the historic side of jazz music um, at that age and who introduced me to listening to Sonny Rollins. And I, rem I still remember the first time dropping the needle on 
uh, Charlie Parker record or, you know, or hearing, uh, you know, A Night at the Village Vanguard, Sonny Rollins for the first time or Joe Henderson for the first time. And all of these kids were really into that music. Um, so I had both of these things going on at once. I had sort of this, you know, very disciplined teacher who was who was kind of preaching uh, a very, you know, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, strict gospel of, of how to learn. And then I had these uh, kids around me who were just way, way into the history of the music. So the, the combination of the two was very heady and, and very um, effective for me. And I, I, I always say that I felt like I hit the lottery when I ended up going to that school from Wisconsin because um, I wouldn't be here talking to you if I hadn't had that experience. It, it, was, uh, it was really a life-changing experience. And um, I'm very, very grateful that I was introduced to, you know, Miles Davis train, Ben Webster, Count Basie, all that stuff when I was uh, in my teenage years, because uh, it was really, it totally changed my life. Yeah, well, I share a similar experience in that uh, I don't know what was happening in Hartford locally with musicians when you were there, but when I was there, <clears throat> when I was growing up in the late 50s and early 60s, Hartford... Uh, is halfway between New York and Boston. So musicians would go up, musicians from New York would go to Boston to play at the Jazz Workshop or Paul's Mall or Lenny's on the Turnpike. And then when they came back on Sunday night, they would work at a place in Hartford called the Hofbrau House. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I've and, heard about that. And I was, yeah. when I was like 14 or 15, 16 years old, I was, it was just unbelievable. I saw at the Hofbrau House, Cannonball Adderley, Sonny Rollins, wow. Ross on Roland Kirk, uh, Maynard Ferguson, uh, Duke Ellington came to Conard High School in 64 uh, with Johnny Incredible. Hodges and Cat Anderson, who blew my mind, and uh, a guy who, who uh, celebrated his 100th, the 100th anniversary of his birth, Dave Brubeck, came to right. Conard as well. So a lot of incredible, it might, and during my time, access to a lot of incredible live music. What about when you were a teenager? Anything happening in Hart West Hartford or Hartford? Well, yeah, you know, uh, Brad Meldow and I ha uh, actually ended up getting a gig in our junior year of, of high school that, that uh, uh, continued through when we graduated at the 880 Club uh, on Maple Avenue in Hartford. And we would go every Wednesday night and play with this drummer, Larry Donatelli. Uh, along with other uh, good local musicians, I mean, including Nat Reeves on bass and and uh, a great piano player named uh, Lee Callahan, and also Don De Palma, and uh, but but mostly with Brad, of course. Um, and many many people were sitting in. Uh, Steve Davis, the trombone player, who was a couple years older than me, uh, was at Hart School of Music at the time, uh, and he was coming down to spin. Uh, also, there was there were a couple other places in Hartford that were having jazz. Um, I remember seeing Freddie Hubbard at the local Holiday Inn when I was fifteen. Uh, he came with uh, with his quintet with uh, young, very young Kenny Garrett um, and uh, Tony Reedus and Mulgrew Miller, I think, and I forget. I think maybe Eric Coleman on bass. Uh, and then every Thursday night, we could you could go down to see the All Stars at 880, uh, which uh, you know I saw Bill Hardman there and Junior Cook. Um, you know, the guys, like you said, would come through uh, usually uh, on uh, on route to uh, either Boston, you know, either north or south. So um, so I saw a lot of those people. And also there's a great place called Lloyd's. I don't know if you remember Lloyd's. Um, they uh, they they had kind of the more major acts coming through. I remember seeing seeing McCoy Tyner there. Uh, I remember seeing Scott Hamilton for the first time at Lloyd's, uh, Terrence Blanchard. You know, there there were a lot of cool people coming through. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was great to, uh, you, you know, even though I, we kind of caught maybe the tail end of it in a way, um, I was lucky enough to see a lot of those, you know, a lot of those great people play locally, which was fantastic. Yeah. Let's go to some of our, our viewer questions and comments here. First of all, Barney Lessing from New York says, please tell us about Joan Chamorro and Andrea Motis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing yeah. his names correctly. What is that about? Yeah, well, Juan Tromoro and, and Andrea, um, the, the, there's um, an incredible music school in Barcelona that Juan Tromoro runs, um, and uh, it's it's just um, an amazing, amazing place. And he's an incredible guy 
Uh, one, one of the best jazz educators I've ever run into. There are, there are a few videos online um, from a few years ago when I went over as a guest soloist with them. And I didn't know anything about them when they called me, but Andrea Motis, who's an amazing young vocalist and trumpet player, uh, saw me playing on YouTube and went to her teacher, Joan, and, and, and said, hey, I, I'd like to bring this guy to, over to the band so he can play with us. And so that's how it happened. So I get this phone call one day from Barcelona and he said, would you like to come over and be a guest soloist with this, with this ensemble? And, and I really didn't know anything about it, but I, then I went over and I heard them for the first time and it blew me away. I mean, these kids are just, um, are just incredible. Actually, I considered uh, putting that for one of the videos that I was gonna, I was gonna give you uh, to listen to today. That we did this incredible version of Waters of March, the, the uh, uh, Chopin song. And, uh, and it's just lovely. I mean, I think it's had like a couple million views now on YouTube, this performance. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, they're just remarkable. She's a remarkable young trumpet player and singer. He's one of the most remarkable jazz educators alive, as far as I'm concerned today. Yeah, you know, there's some amazingly uh, talented people on this planet playing this music. Uh, you know, when I first started in the 50s and 60s, it was, it was kind of centered in the U.S., American musicians would travel. But now, really, it's a global thing. I mean, it's Jazz is being played. It's, it's a music that's being embraced all over the world. Let's go to a question here from Ivan. How do you think the age of people enjoying jazz music increased nowadays? And why youngsters prefer listening to such genres as hip-hop or pop? Okay, that's I think I understand what he's saying. He's question. saying, why, do, why, does the, why does the audience skew, skew older, is, I think is what he's trying to say. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I, You know, I think... It, it it does skew older in certain places and in certain situations. I mean, certainly when I when I travel and play, you know, concerts for different jazz societies around uh, the U.S. or things like that, you do see uh, it's usually older people that are heading those things up, and and you, and the audience does tend to skew uh, towards maybe a more of a baby boomer uh, uh, type era. But um, but at the same time. I will say that I think, you know, especially in New York City, when I go to S Smalls, say, you know, if I if I go to play at Smalls or Mesro, um, that's not necessarily true. Um, you do see more of a mix of ages at, in certain venues. And, and also you see more of a diverse audience in certain in certain places, too. It's not just so much of a white audience, which is also another kind of issue, um, you know, around around the world is that oftentimes you don't see uh, a very uh, a diverse audience for jazz. But um, I think that's changing. I think that you're starting to see maybe with the advent of jazz education, you're starting to see a lot of younger people uh, from all over the place of different cultures that are just really interested in this music because they fall in love with it. And I think that is creating a new audience that is uh, younger and they are there, there are going to be fans uh, into the future that um, are into the music that are not just from one, you know, demographic. So I think it's I think it's slowly changing, and I think um, that's healthy. Yeah, I think uh, YouTube. Uh, you know, I have a love hate relationship with YouTube. I hate the fact that all the musicians whose music on YouTube don't get anything. <laughs> yeah. That's not a good thing. But I love the fact that you could go on YouTube and listen to just about anything from the history of jazz. And not only recordings, but see, you can, see, you can watch Art Tatum play. You can watch Eric Dolphy. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. And I think having that ability, giving people that option, will slowly grow the music over time. Now, I've noticed, tell me if you think this is true, that... There's a different audience in the United States that there is, than there is in Europe and Japan. My theory behind yeah. that is better education, <clears throat> excuse me, outside the United States. A, a, a level of art sophistication that doesn't, that, you know, we don't find in American schools. Um, That's true. And I personally do not listen to very much hip hop or rap music. Um, I recognize... Uh, rap music as, as an art form in terms of uh, poetry and rhythm. For me, not enough emotional content in terms of melody and harmony, but it is what it is. But I think that came, that music came from 
the end of music education in so many, in so many schools. Because mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot more money in music education. Kids were able to get to rent instruments. And they may right. not have been professionals, but their ears were opened. Now it's a little bit harder. And our culture yeah. is so diverse. The internet divides us into so many different spaces. Uh, it's hard sometimes to just reach people. I think, uh, uh, however you may feel about uh, Kamasi Washington's playing, he has been able to reach uh, a younger audience with what he does. And I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, you have a, uh, a number of recordings. I'd like to talk about which ones you'd like to recommend. And also I'd like you to share with us uh, the new trio recording that you started before the pandemic. Right. Um, well, I think the, the, the one that always comes up for most people whenever I travel, they, everyone, everyone loves the duo record that I did with Brad Meldow, uh, which, which uh, was very, very special and was recorded, um, man, like 20 years ago or so now. Um, I, if I remember correctly, it was recorded maybe right before September 11th, I forget, or right after. I can't remember. But in any case, um, uh, yeah, that, that one was very special for me. I mean, simply because, uh, you know, he's, he was my kind of one of my oldest musical friends and, and obviously, you know, a genius piano player. And, and that, that record turned out really, really well. It was kind of just a special moment in time. Um, so that's certainly recommended. Uh, that's called Don't Explain. And um, uh, also another one that I really enjoyed making uh, was with uh, some of my mentors and heroes. I made one with Kenny Barron and Victor Lewis and Rufus Reed uh, called Don't, I mean, called Don't Explain, called uh, We Used to Dance. Um, that was about uh, 12 years ago that I made that. And, and that was just a dream come true. I was able to... Um, uh, a very kind friend of mine was able to underwrite that project, and and um, you know I was able to go in the studio with those guys and and make that record, and that was that was really a dream too, because I was really into those late later Stan Getz records with that rhythm section. I really loved uh, records Anniversary and Serenity, and uh, I, it was always a dream for me to play with that rhythm section. So um, those two immediately come to mind, um, and uh, as far as um, as far as the new trio recording, um, I had been playing with this trio with my friends uh, Ernesto Servini, fantastic drummer from Canada and a uh, great bassist from Brooklyn named Dan Loomis. Um, we actually, Dan and I both play in Ernesto's band called Turboprop, uh, which is a sextet that plays uh, that's out of Toronto area. Um, and, uh, as a result of, of my relationship with Ernesto, uh, we ended up doing a clinic at university of Toronto one day, uh, while I was up there touring with the larger ensemble, but we only, uh, did the clinic with, uh, just the three of us and it really felt great. And we were really, we weren't even really thinking about it, but we played for all the students at U of T and, and, um, afterwards Ernesto said, man, I, I, I wish we could do this again. And he said, would you, uh, would you be into it if, if Dan and I tried to book a tour for us? I said, yeah, sure, let's, let's do that. So, um, so they actually booked a European tour for the trio. Um, we went over there, did a bunch of really, really nice gigs in some really cool places, uh, play, played in, in Georgia overseas, and, which was amazing, in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, played in Germany and in, in uh, France, all, sor- uh, all sorts of places. So... It was really a fantastic European tour with the trio. And after that, I realized, I said, you know what, let's let's go straight in the studio after this tour is done and let's document this. Um, for one thing, it was inspiring to me because having my own trio tour inspired me to write about eight new tunes, um, seven of which I think made it onto the record. Uh, it's not out yet, um, but um, it's, um, I think it, the, the record is gonna be called The Bright Side. Uh, which is one of the songs on the record. So I'm really happy uh, with this trio. I'm really happy, uh, even though we got sidetracked by the virus, that uh, once once things kind of open up again, this record will come out and um, people will be able to hear some of my new compositions. And it's it's the most heavily, I mean, it's the it, it's all original compositions on this record, which is the first time that I've ever done that uh, in my life, uh, in, including there are three by the other guys too. There's two by, I think, uh, Dan Loomis and one by Ernesto Cervini. So... Uh, but the, but the bulk of the record is my writing, which I'm very very proud of. 
looking forward to hearing that. You know, I, I love standards, but I think that it's important people write new music and play their own music. So mm -hmm. I'll uh, look, look forward to that. Uh, you mentioned Stan Getz. I got to tell you my Stan Getz story since Hartford sure. figures into the story. So uh, young jazz listener, 1962, I heard Stan Getz Desifinato. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Really got into the bossa nova. Uh, Stan Getz came to the Bushnell Auditorium for a her, her concert. Wow. <laughs> Had to go see him. I, I was 13 or 14. So he played the concert. Uh, fantastic. Afterwards, I, I don't know why, but I said, I got to go backstage and meet him. So I like went through the, it was like a gutsy, ballsy kid. I don't know where this came yeah. from. You know, I just went backstage and I saw a couple of stage hands. Where's Stan Getz? They pointed to his dressing room. So I knocked on the door, no answer. And then I waited and I opened the door and I looked in and I saw he was like sitting uh, on a chair in his undershirt and he had a fifth of something, vodka or whisking on the table. And I just knew, don't go in there. You yeah, know? right. <laughs> just not the place to go. Okay, but that, you know, that didn't stop me from, from, from loving his music. So yeah. as fate would have it, that was like, like 63 or 64, 1979, I'm writing for Downbeat Magazine. I'm at a party for Columbia Records, and lo and behold, there's Stan Getz. And he comes up to me and he says, are you Brett Premack? And he said, yeah. I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I really dig your writing, man. I said, oh, my oh, wow. God. You know, here's wow. this guy. And then, of course, uh, you know, he had like, uh, I would say like his, his uh, earlier years, he had some difficulties. He had substance abuse issues and everything. Yeah. But he really straightened that out, I'd say, in the last 20 years of his life. And that period, as you mentioned, produced, you know, some of his greatest playing. It really did. It really did. Absolutely. My goodness. I, I love, you know, I love I love later Stan Getz for a lot of reasons. For I mean, I love the early stuff, too. I mean, the early stuff it sounds really impeccable. Uh, when you listen to like, especially like the stuff with Jimmy Rainey, I, I love the stuff with Jimmy Rainey. It's incredible. And it's just on such a high level, uh, just as an instrumentalist, it's just unassailable. It's incredible. But um, I feel like later in his life, you really hear more vulner vulnerability in his playing, which to me makes it even deeper. Uh, you know, when I hear those records with Kenny Barron and, and those later things, you know, you hear a little bit more of the vulnerable. He let he lets a little bit more air inside of his solos. Um, there's something about it where you hear a maturing and and maybe maybe a a, um, a softening of of his of his playing in a certain way that I I think is really really great. Okay, got some questions from Joke Jacques. I'm not sure. Talk about finding the right setup and read in mouthpiece sizes. Also developing your sound. We talked about the sound. Let's focus on the the setup, the read, and the mouthpieces. Okay, I knew this question was coming. It always has to come. Um, so you know, saxophonists are we're we're all obsessed with mouthpieces, and you can em easily empty your bank account uh, buying vintage mouthpieces. But um, I, the thing I would say is about that is that you should play what feels good to you. Um, you should try a bunch of different things, and and you know if if something uh, hits you that that you say, oh, this feels like home. This feels like it makes it easy for me to play. Um, that's what you should go for. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I I've always played uh, Auto Link style mouthpieces generally, or Selmer Soloist style mouthpieces. You know, things that are pretty, you know, run of the mill as far as design goes. Um, you know, I, I, I like mouthpieces that are fairly moderate, you know, not too small tip, not too big tip, uh, with a moderate read with, you know, sort of a medium uh, to medium hard read. And uh, I want things that are going to create ease. So, so you, you know, I, I'm not looking to like, you know, uh, become a He-Man and, and put on a, you know, 11 star mouthpiece with a five read. Some guys do that, but it's just not me. I, I don't like to work that hard. So um, I like to have a very moderate setup, like around a seven star tip opening with like a three or a three and a half read generally yeah question from owen walter how was it starting out in the jazz scene what does it take to develop relationships that make people coming back to hire you for gigs and how did you get there good question uh well 
you know, when, when I first started doing it, um, I was just always really hungry to take my horn out of the case and get it in my mouth in, in any situation I possibly could. And that's what I did for many, many years. Um, I said no to nothing. I never said no. I, uh, for the first, you know, probably 15, 20 years that I was doing this, uh, anytime there was a chance to put, put my horn in my mouth, I was there. Uh, even if it was not a great situation, I would, I would go just because I wanted to blow. Um, so, uh, that's the first thing is I think if you're in this for the long haul, you have to have an inner need to play. Um, I think there that, and, and if you don't have that inner need to play, you shouldn't be doing this as a, as a profession. Um, there's something about that, that sort of, uh, you know, maybe it's like the Joe Henderson said, the inner urge, uh, it, it is sort of an inner urge because, um, you know, I, for instance, I remember, I always tell my students this story. Uh, when Cleopatra's Needle first op opened up on the Upper West Side and they started having jazz music, they had sessions every, you know, every night or every other night. I forget exactly when it was, but I remember one night it was, it was cold out. It was, it was wintertime. It was snowing outside. And, uh, I, I had caught the very last hour of this session. I was coming from another gig and, um, I walked into Cleo's and Roy Hargrove was there and he was killing it. Just sounding so great. And I didn't have my horn with me uh, because I had dropped it off at home. And uh, Roy was so killing that I, I, I said, I have to get a piece of this. So I ran outside. I got in a cab. I paid $25 to get home. I got my horn. I paid $25 in a cab to get back so I could catch the last two tunes of the set and play with Roy. And that's how much it meant to me, how much it meant to me to, to, uh, to have that experience. I mean, you know, I was willing to pay for two cab rides to play a couple songs at the end of a jam session. And I think that's, I think that's indicative of the kind of, um, the kind of hunger that you need for this music in order to really, uh, dedicate yourself to the, to the degree that you need to, in order to be successful. I mean, as far as the other parts, um, you know, I think the big the big part of being a successful jazz musician, in addition to knowing your history, in addition to doing all of the musical work that you need to do, um, you have to be cool as a person. You have to you have to be able to be go into different situations and conduct yourself well and be a, be a cool dude. I mean, you have to be able to go and get along with other people and be able to navigate difficult situations within a band. And and uh, so it's it's not just uh, musical uh, um, uh, skills that come into play. It really is kind of life skills and hu human skills that are really, really important uh, to doing that. So th th that's, those are the things that I would say to anyone who's starting a career in jazz is just to, you know, really be, try and be as much of a team player as you can. Try and put your ego second and, and, and also just immerse yourself in the history of the music and put the horn in your mouth as much as you possibly can. Now, here's a question uh, that's interesting to me because I'm a huge fan of ballads and I bemoan the fact that people don't play ballads like they used to. But here's the question from Q Williams. What gave you your most growth when learning to play ballads when you were a developing saxophonist? Listening to Gene Ammons. <laughs> that's go. what gave me my most growth. Uh, Gene Ammons was the first, the first guy that I listened to. I, I, bought, uh, I bought the record Gentle Jug. And, uh, and I was, um, I, I remember the first time I heard Gene Ammons, actually they use one of his tracks. Um, I'm trying to remember there's like a, there's a movie from the eighties. I think it was like with Ellen Barkin, I forget, but they use a Gene Ammons track. They use him playing uh, someone to watch over me in, in a movie. Actually, that might've been the name of the movie. Um, in any case, uh, and I heard that in the movie and, and, and I think my dad heard it too. And he said, man, who's that saxophone player? I said, I don't know, but I need to find out. And so we figured it out that it was Gene Ammons, and, and I went out and got that record, Gentle Jug, which is just full of incredible ballads of Gene Ammons playing ballads. And so that was the beginning of my real love for playing ballads, was listening to how he phrased those ballads. And in fact, even when I play ballads now, um, I still steal shamelessly from Gene Ammons. I mean, I, I, there's still so much of his playing in my sound uh, when I when I do play ballads, and then of course it, you know uh, when I got into Getz, I heard the way Getz plays ballads, and um, and I you know uh, all sorts of different players that I really sort of ended up gravitating towards um, with with that with that ability. I mean Stanley Turrentine and all sorts of different people. So 
Uh, um, that's how I really started was just, you know, just really immersing myself and listening to how uh, great saxophonists and great singers sing ballads too. That's the other part is I was listening heavily to Billie Holiday. I was listening, you know, heavily to Sarah Vaughan and Carmen McRae. Um, you know, to all those, Billy Eckstein, you know, I was listening to all those people and, and really getting a lot from them too. So, so that was a big, that, that was a big influence in learning how to play ballads as well. Here's a question from Vinny Limon. Vinny, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Are you gigging in clubs during the pandemic? Pandemic? Any new best practices for staying safe while performing in an indoor gig during the pandemic? Well, you know, I mean, there's no, I don't know if there's any uh, great answer for that. I have played at Smalls uh, two or three times. Um, I've been careful when I'm not, um, when I'm not uh, playing a solo to put my mask on when I'm, when I'm not playing. Um, you know, it's, I, it's one of those things where you have to weigh, weigh the risks. And I haven't done it often. I've done it two or three times since this since this thing started. Um, another reason why I mean, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I I I actually do have. I, I got tested for antibodies. I actually had COVID early on, um, and I and I I got through it. Um, so I do have. Or I did have antibodies, as far as I know. But but of course, that's not that's not a guarantee that you're not going to get it again. Um, I've just I've I've tried to make smart choices about that and 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 keep the risk factors low um i think all you can do is just to you know uh put your mask on and and uh you know wash your hands and keep your distance from people as much as you possibly can um i probably won't be playing very many more live performances until until the uh, vaccine comes so yeah you know, i mean that's, that's, that's just the just the reality of the situation so i yeah. hope it, i hope it wasn't too bad for you Oh, the COVID? Well, <laughs> no, I'm lucky. I mean, well, I consider, I mean, it was bad enough. I mean, I, I was really down for about a month. Um, and, and it was, you know, and, and the thing that, the thing that was the most, uh, uh, the thing that I uh, was the hardest about it was the fatigue. I, I have never been so tired in my life. Um, and uh, I was just knocked out basically for a month. And then I got through it luckily, but I have, you know, we, we, we have people that we know in common that passed away. I mean, you know, um, the yeah. great Wallace Roney and, 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 uh, you know, there, there, and I have another friend who was lucky to be alive that this, my, my friend, Ron Wilkins, who's an incredible trombone player, uh, was really touch and go for, for quite a while. He was in the hospital for a long time and on the ventilator and the whole thing. And, and, uh, so it's, it's no joke, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what, and I want, I don't want to get too into, into a political thing, but that's, what's so maddening about what's going on in the country is that, is that people I think are, te are really not coming from our president too, but, but, uh, are, a lot of people are not taking it, giving it the, the gravity that it deserves, and 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 they're not taking it as seriously as it as it should be taken, um, and and that's really unfortunate. It really is, and uh, leadership is important, especially in times like these. And the leadership in the United States has not been up to the task, and that is an understatement. Okay, here's a no. question from interesting yep. name Neve Niam. I'm not sure if that's Vietnamese or that's what strikes me there. How important is it to be able to memorize a new tune on the spot? How did you or did you develop the skill? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know how important it is to memorize a tune on the spot. I mean, that's sort of an old school thing. You know, that, that's what I mean. I did do that to an extent, um, not with like the super old masters. But I remember um, it, when I was in my early 20s, uh, Peter Bernstein and Larry Goldings and Bill Stewart had their organ trio gig at Augie's uh, in the early 90s. And those guys are, you know, they're a couple years older than me. And so I always really looked up to them as kind of big brothers musically. And I would off, I would always go and see them play because they were just so fantastic. And, and, uh, and they were always playing standards that I didn't know. So there were lots of nights where um, I'd bring my horn, I'd watch two sets. And then on the, on the, the late set, the third set, um, either Larry or Peter would say, Hey man, you want to, you know, you want to come and play a tune? And I'd say, yeah, okay. And Larry would say, well, you know, do you know, will you still be mine? And I remember at the time I said, no, I don't know it. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to play it. I'm going to play the melody and you listen to me, uh, on the first solo and pick it up. 
and pick up the changes Whoa. and go, you know? So, so that, that was, you know, so, and I did that kind of thing a lot where I would just kind of throw myself into the deep end with, with guys. And I, I was lucky enough to have guys that were patient enough with me that they allowed me to um, kind of figure it out on the fly. But having said that, I, I, I'm, I'm always, I always like to be air on the side of being prepared. So I, you know, um, learning tunes at home, I really, I try and go to the source. Like I, th that's, what's great about YouTube. Like you were saying, Brett, is that now there's so much information out there that you can go to like very, very early recordings of a given standard and find out what, you know, get close to the, what the uh, composer's original intent was. So that's, that's kind of what I like to do with most standards that I play. I try and find very early versions of them so I can kind of get to the the crux of them before they were arranged too much, you know, uh, uh, you know, to 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 be becoming something else. So um, that's what I would say about that. I I've, I always prefer to learn uh, standards, you know, melody first, bassline second, harmony third, and going to an original source uh, as early as possible uh, to the composer. Now, one of our uh, regular viewers, Yvette, wants to know about, have you been doing any streaming? You mentioned Smalls. Have you been doing any streaming from home or any other situations? Not really. I mean, I, I've been I've been putting out videos occasionally. A lot of times I, I get sent uh, uh, equipment to demo. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, a lot of times someone will send me a new mouthpiece and say, hey, can you make a video of this new mouthpiece? And I'll do something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's probably to my own detriment. I'm not super savvy, uh, with Instagram. Uh, there was a while where I was trying to post some content every day and then I, you know, I ended up getting sidetracked. And so I, I don't do that much of that. Um, I probably, I should be doing more of that. I just, I don't want it to be haphazard. You know, I, I don't want it to be like, just like, okay, here's my, you know, two courses of rhythm changes today, and I'm just going to put that out there. And I mean, there's a lot of that already. I think if I were to do something like that, I would I would want it to be to have a little bit more intention behind it. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to figure that out. I, I do have younger musicians playing with me who are a little bit more tech savvy and a little bit more internet savvy. So maybe you'll see more stuff. Actually, that's true. The trio record. Um, that I made, I know that uh, Ernesto and Dan are going to be broadcasting some of the video from the studio. So, so that will be coming. Uh, so that 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 will be uh, released fairly soon for people to see. So, yeah, there is some some content. Okay, and our final question here before we're going to go to uh, listen to some watching some of your music, Max Cullen. Do you find yourself changing who you want it to sound like a lot? Oh sure, you know when when I when I first when I first started playing uh, jazz, the the first two people that I heard and it was it was it was really a, a very wide swath. So it was like I I, I, I loved Charlie Parker and I and I loved Michael Brecker, and I know that you have a lot to say about Michael Brecker, Brett, because I know that you knew him well. Um, but uh, and those and and I had those two guys as my favorites when I when I was uh, sixteen years old, but I didn't know anything in between. Um, so at first, you know, I was playing these, uh, you know, Charlie Parker lines, but with kind of this record kind of sound on my saxophone. And then I had a, I had a private teacher who said, you know, if you like Michael Brecker, you're probably going to like this guy, John Coltrane. I said, oh, well, who's that? You know, and he dropped the needle on Coltrane's sound. I, the first Coltrane I heard was the night has a thousand eyes and it immediately blew my mind. And uh, and I became very obsessed with Coltrane. And then I had another teacher who said, "Oh, you might like Sonny Rollins," and so on and so forth. So, yes, my my sound changed dramatically uh, whenever I heard a saxophone player uh, that really spoke to me. And there, the you know, top five were probably Johnny Griffin, Coltrane, Joe Henderson, uh, uh, Getz. Um, maybe Gene Ammons might be in there too. You know, there's 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 a there's kind of a handful of guys that really uh, shifted my sound because they had such an indelible in, uh, impact on me when I first heard them. So yes, I made I made very very intentional strides towards um, digesting the sound and the vocabulary and all of the idiosyncrasies of all of those players at a certain time. So my my sound did change dramatically several times. We're going to run over a little bit here uh, because a question just came in. Uh, you know, we were talking about. Uh, what I believe is, is the necessity for musicians to write as well as embrace the Great American Soundbook. 
Bruce uh, has a question. What modern jazz composers now are you connecting with you? Are connecting with me? I well, I mean, some some of the some of the people that are dear to my heart, um, Omer Avital, the great Israeli bass player who I've played with for about twenty or twenty five years, is an incredible writer. Um, I've always loved his writing. Um, very, uh, you know, Middle Eastern uh, folk uh, oriented. Um, you know, there's that huge influence of Middle Eastern music, of Arabic mu Arabic music in his in his in his playing and in in his writing. He's incredible. I would say also um, the guitarist Kurt Rosenwinkel blows me away uh, with his writing. Um, uh, I love this uh, uh, South American um, uh, composer Guillermo Klein um, is is from Argentina. I think he's from Argentina. Um, Guillermo Klein is amazing. Um, you know there there are there are so there are so many um it's 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 you know it's hard to it's hard to even pin down my favorites because i i am continually hearing new compositions from new people that uh, are are really just tremendous and and uh, every time i go out and hear hear someone um new that that is really strong i i just it always blows me away so um there's 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 quite a few there's also this really interesting saxophonist from europe named marius nesset uh, who's just an incredible virtuoso, and and he's he's almost more uh, of a fusion of modern classical music and jazz, and but he's he's kind of mind blowing. He's really an incredible composer, Marius Nesset. So there's quite a few. Um, there's a lot of people that I really really enjoy and in, in, that are writing in all sorts of different ways. Well, jazz like life, jazz keeps changing, and uh, you know every few years uh, someone. Says, ah, oh, jazz, you know, that's dead. Sonny Rollins once said to me, you can't kill jazz. Jazz is a spirit. Yeah. And I think as long as there's people listening to music, they're going to be listening to jazz. Joel, I want to thank you for sharing an hour with us today. It was really interesting to get to know you. And you. Uh, your music, which is fantastic. And we're going to go out here with uh, some Charlie Parker. Uh, everyone, thank you. Uh, please stay safe and uh, come back next week for drummer Joe Farnsworth. And here we go.
Vamos.